We continue now with our course on divorce, PS157 Divorce, and we are in the U for unmarried. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, 1 Corinthians 7, 8. Paul is said to have been married at one time, but his wife probably died. For the cause of Christ, he remained unmarried. His advice follows suit. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. 1 Corinthians seven eleven. If you are or have been married, but are not currently legally together by law, you either need to rebuild that marriage or plan to spend the rest of your life single. Besides, if you couldn't make it work the first time around, what makes you think you could do it another and another and another? But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. 1 Corinthians seven thirty-two. Men, before you dive into marriage, make sure of your place with the Lord. Remember the first commandment is to put God first. Don't get married unless it is God's will. Now, there's a difference between a wife and a virgin. I would hope so. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. 1 Corinthians 7.34 The same applies to women. Before you say, I do, be sure you have said, I do, to the leadership of Christ first. If you are already married, bring it to Jesus. And then we turn to S for single. I lost my spot. Computer glitch. <laughs> well, actually, it's probably a me glitch. And, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her that is put away, doth commit adultery. His disciples say unto him, If the case of a man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Matthew 19, 9 through 12. If you are never married single, you had better be sure of yourself and your future mate before you take your vows. If you are divorced single, you need to be sure that your divorce was in accord with the teachings of God or he will not consider you single and will count your other sexual relations as adultery. You have heard it's that it was said by them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whoso looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. 
Matthew 5, 27 and 28. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Matthew five, thirty-two. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Mark ten, twelve. There are only three scriptural acceptable reasons for getting or having a divorce. One, natural death. Your mate dies. Fornication, the one given by Jesus in Matthew. And an unbelieving deserter, as given to us by Paul. All other excuses are just personal sins that lead to unlawful adultery. And now we turn to remarriage. Question. If I get divorced, can I get married again to someone else? Well, if you are divorced, are you still married? Question. Then if I'm still married, how can I be divorced? Yes. According to some one-wifers, you can get a divorce and still be married. The way they play their tune, all persons who are divorced and remarried are bigamous, living in open adultery. These one-wifers will split a passage in parts to prove a point, i.e. in Matthew 19, 1 to 9. Quote, the one marriage adherence put verse 7 and 8 into Old Testament Jewish settings of Deuteronomy 24 but places verses 3 and 6 in the New Testament setting. They will tell us that Moses' permissive law was for Israel only and does not apply to either the Gentiles or the church. Again, we find one-wifers adding their opinions to the scripture as if they were qualified to amend God's word in Romans 7 verses 2 and 3. where it says, quote, bound by the law, parenthesis, original law of marriage, parenthesis, to her husband. You see what they added? 1 Corinthians 7, 39, quote, bound by the law, parenthesis, original law of marriage, parenthesis. So in two passages, they have added to the word of God. This original law of marriage is supposedly found in Genesis 2:24. No proof is given that the law Paul refers to is that of Genesis 2. And again, Genesis 2.24 is flesh joining flesh. Not a ceremony. Another thing we're told is to back up these private interpretations, as in 2 Peter 1.20, is that the four Gospels are exactly that, four different Gospels rather than Jesus making a statement and it having been recorded more than once, what we are led to believe is that Jesus made four statements. Two of these are said to be in Matthew and the other two in Mark and Luke. However, contrary to popular opinion, the statements of Matthew 19 and in Mark and Luke are the same dialogue. The major difference is the exception clause of Matthew. Accordingly, then, we are told Matthew was writing to give a proper interpretation of law. What happened is, thus saith the Lord. And what happened to the spirit interpretation? Inspiration. Why the credit to Matthew? After all, it isn't his statement. Thus, we who are believe all the Bible, are accused of thinking that divorce and remarriage in the Old Testament was for adultery, which, according to Epp, is not so. So here again we have constant opposing opinions between teachers. One would tell us we are can remarry if divorce was for fornication, 
continued adultery. After all, why should the innocent party be punished for a sin he did not commit and for which he cannot repent? Got that? All this is, of course, providing the grounds were adultery, desertion, or death. Then again, the opposition is that there is no divorce and remarriage for a Christian. Not even when a church epistle, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, says we are not under bondage. Back to the question concerning divorce and being married. If a Christian gets a divorce for biblical reasons, is he single? According to Dr. Waite, he may be single, but is not authorized to remarry. Thus, you can divorce and live a hard single life, but if you remarry, you would have more than one wife. Hmm. Therefore, divorce and remarriage would disqualify a man from the office of bishop or deacon. On the other hand, we are told that for biblical grounds, divorce makes the first marriage broken entirely or completely dissolved, leaving the innocent party free to marry again without the charge of having two husbands. <clears throat> Another author allows for remarriage, limiting divorce to fornication only. According to Shelton, infidelity annuls the marriage covenant, making the partners no longer one flesh, but rather divorced and single with freedom to marry as if the offending party were dead. This, of course, is offensive to one wifers who consider divorce and remarriage the unpardonable sin for Christians. Fowler said God honors only one wife and not one wife at a time either. Reverend Green would accuse us of having more than one living mate. But how can you have a mate if you are divorced and not mating. Is the relationship a one flesh relationship or not? This whole dialogue is one big game of round robin. Stick to the Bible, believe your Bible, and follow your Bible, and leave the rest to somebody else. And next we will go to restoration, Christian restoration, in 1 John 1, 1, verses 7 through 10, is it true or not true? Continuing with divorce, PS 157, of course, number. And we are at restoration, Christian restoration. Is 1 John 1, 7 to 10 true or not? <clears throat> but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The epilogue to this study is the seven ifs of forgiveness. I ask you again, is it true? Among the adherents of the one wifer's philosophy, we find limited to little nothing in forgiveness and or restitution. Anyone who has committed the unpardonable sin of getting a divorce and remarrying is disqualified as a bona fide Christian and cannot be received as a full member of God's church, saved maybe, but not allowed to participate. We are told that people who want divorce and remarriage are just trying to get around obeying, and it really doesn't matter whether it happened before or after salvation.
But while divorce and remarriage may be terrible, it is not the unpardonable sin in God's eyes, nor should it be in the eyes of believers. We are told that if you divorce was before salvation and you were single when you got saved, then you are free to remarry and the church has no right to refuse leadership. This would be penalizing the Christian for something which occurred before salvation, which is not right. But these things are contradictory, not only between authors, but within the writings of a single author himself. Epp has said sin is pardonable, but refutes the statement by saying 1 Timothy 3, 2 and 12 not to have more than one wife at a time, also not to be divorced and remarried. The bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. 1 Timothy 3, uh, verses 2 and 12. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, Titus 1, verses 5 and 6. Oliver Green has some good notes on Timothy and Titus, even though he is a one-wifer. He tells us these words could not apply to a single man or to a young man still living in his father's house. Green tells us that a bishop is to be a one-wifer man, and he doesn't mean one wife at a time. The bishop should be married, have a wife, be head of a household, a mature adult. After all, a man called to oversee God's house should be a head of house in every respect, having the respect of all members of his family, a family man. That means, just like the priest in the Old Testament, a priest of Levi could not be a priest until he was 30 years old. So if you're married young, around 20, then that gives you 10 years to raise some children and show that you know how to do it. So you should not be a bishop or a deacon until you're 30. Numbers chapter 4 repeatedly informs us that the age for a Levite is to enter the priesthood is 30. I just said that. And they retire at 50. Certainly, a person marrying at age 20 would have 10 years to raise some children and prove his ability as a leader. So, you got that twice. No extra charge. Reverend Green carries on in the one wife or vein, saying that a man who has two living wives has no right in a position of leadership in the New Testament church. Such a case would be a scandal and bring discredit upon the church. So we see that we are told on one end to forgive and restore, and then on the other to bring these persons into judgment when it comes time to choose leadership. The worst of attitude is displayed as follows. Quote, they should live in a adulterous situation. No. What? Separate immediately won't let them become a member of the church. You are committing adultery. It is continual adultery. Hmm. So, this particular guy says if you're in a second marriage, you're living in adultery, and you need to disannul it. Rice, on the other hand, tells us not to commit another sin with a second divorce. Adultery as a cause for divorce may be condemned in Moses' law, but the law is the schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. We should therefore confess for the wrong we have done, and God will forgive it. Remember, though, it cannot be undone.
It joins in with Dr. Rice concerning forgiveness and restitution. Fellowship with a Christian after his conversion is not to be based on his lifestyle before his conversion. God will forgive the past and will consider the present marriage tied to be the binding one. Brother Shelton joins in the plea for restoration, stating that a fallen party can be saved by repentance, confession, and forsaking of sin. Concluding this area of restoration with Theodore Epp, we find his statements encouraging, even though they are from a one wifer with tongue in cheek. Quote, God expects the past to be put under the blood of Christ. God does not tolerate sin, but he does forgive and restore, even though divorced and remarried, after salvation, the believer is restored. When he confesses his sin, Complete forgiveness of sin is given to that person, and he is justified from his guilt. Hmm. So, what we have here is forgive some sins, but not others. Forget some acts, but not others, especially divorce and remarriage. I wonder, if we did reduce marriage to the act of sexual intercourse, and polygamy is unpardonable, how many preachers would have to be fired for having had sex before or after salvation with one or more partners? Exodus 1. Is spousal or engagement? Zest is the boiling pot of marriage, ostracized by adultery, divorce for every cause, unmarried, never or divorce, single, never married, Exodus 1, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And that concludes divorce. And we now go to forgiveness. And number one is 1 John 1, 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's number two. Number three, First John 1, 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Number four, First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number five, First John 1, 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Number six, First John 2, 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. <clears throat> Number seven, First John 2, 3. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. And we shall stop there on this edition.